Hi everyone and welcome to the Sir Patrick Geddes Commemorative Lecture 2023. Um, today we're delighted to uh, welcome Imundeep Kaur um, who is going to give our um, lecture for today and the focus of that is on the social and ecological transition and the critical role of our homes, streets and neighbourhoods. We're delighted that so many of you can join us today and we're looking forward to an excellent set of questions either in the chat or the Q&A that Emmy will hopefully be able to answer at the end. So as you know, it's the Patrick Geddes um, Commemorative Lecture. We hold this annually. And just for those that are maybe a little bit newer to this, Patrick Geddes is a widely regarded um, as the founder of modern town planning. His interest in the natural sciences led him to a professorship at Dundee University in Botany, after which he developed his interest in sociology and planning. He lived most of his life in Edinburgh, and during that time he established the Edinburgh Social Union, promoted a wide range of sympathetic development and conservation, redevelopment and conservation schemes the length of the Royal Mile, largely for university residential accommodation. And he founded a publishing company, founded the Franco-Scottish Society, became a major sports sponsor of the arts, developed summer schools, promoted international festivals, and published seminal texts such as Cities and Evolution. He also spent time in India as chair in sociology um, at Bombay University, and he prepared a plan for the Hebrew University at Jerusalem. And he finally retired to flat France, where he founded the Collège d'Ecosse in Montpellier. He was knighted in London in the year of his death. This RTPI Scotland um, event holds that Gadesian thinking as a way to advance it to the future. And this year's lecture, we're delighted that Imindeep Kaur um, can join us for that. Imi's a co-founder and director of Civic Square. Civic Square is a public square, neighbourhood lab and creative and participatory platform focused on regenerative civic and social infrastructure within neighbourhoods. And he's part of a creative and dynamic leadership team who work alongside the local neighbourhood to offer a bold approach to visioning, building and investing in civic infrastructure for neighbourhoods of the future. She's also an active member of Project A00. Emmy's a part of the Donut Economics Action Lab advisory team, a Birmingham Hippodrome trustee, um, a Birmingham Open Media board member and an Inclusive Economy Partnership board champion. Um, she's also a National Lottery Community Fund Advisory Board member as well. With all of that comes a number of awards and nominations as well, and that includes her work um, in on a voluntary basis where she ran the TEDx Brum um, Forum between 2012 and 2017. Um, those recognised notable honours um, include the 2018 Impact Hub Birmingham being named Anesta New Radical for her services to the City of Birmingham, Aston University's School of Life and Health Sciences granted Emmy an honorary doctorate. And in 2020, Emmy was awarded a prestigious Ashoka Fellowship. And we are absolutely delighted that you can join us today. I'd like to hand over to you now, Emmy. Thank you so much. Um, it's a real delight to be here. And um, I just want to say thank you to all of you. I mean, I can't really see uh, anyone or what they're doing. Um, and also, after that very extensive uh, bio, it might feel like, um, you know, I, it feels a bit awkward for me to listen to as well. And I just want to say, look, I'm, I'm, my name's Amy. I uh, was a, have lived and grown up in in Birmingham, and I was a young person who listened to the city when they when they said to us, "We're the youngest, most diverse uh, in Europe, and we need our young people to stay here." and believe and invest. And I guess that's um, what I went on to do. Now I'm going to talk a lot about social and ecological transition. I'm going to talk a lot about new economic thinking and the role of homes, streets and neighbourhoods. Um, and it's all going to get quite theoretical for the for the um, point of this lecture with some practice and some examples from our work. But given the time, I'd need at least half a day with you all to really uh, sink you deeply into the scale of, of possibility that I have seen out in the world and in the work we have done. So rather than start with just going through a big long talk and at the end telling you, um, you know, this this is what it feels like. 
Um, over the last couple of years in the inner city neighborhood of Ladywood, where we're based, we've been really thinking about what uh, in practice the social, ecological, political, infrastructure, everything transition looks like, uh, what, what does adaptation, mitigation, um, transition, transformation look like with a broad coalition of neighbours and partners. And so to land you in, I want you to just sit back for a second, pick up your cup of tea or your lunch and just watch the video. And first, I want you to have a sense of what our work feels like. And then I'm going to tell you a bit more about the theory and thinking that you might expect from more traditional lecture of this of this thought of this sort. So um, sit back for a few minutes and enjoy. Put your hands in the soil. Feel the groan and feel the joy. Or sit with the hurt. Stare into the dirt. Occupy the bandstands. Gather lost citizens. Climb down your pyramids. Relinquish your privilege. Welcome strangers to your table. As though they were angels. Make space for the spent. Feel the lament. Break your vows to the powers. Plant trees and grow flowers. Share the resources. Free all the horses. All citizens, put your hands in the soil and feel the growth. Can you feel the joy and be still and be still? Down by the riverside, who's not afraid to die? Emerge from the waves, broke loose from the powers of the age. Live now, citizens of what's left of the age to come. Behold the Messiah dying for the lands we are crucifying. Break bread and take drink, all feel and think. Shed tears every day. For everything we throw away, mourn for your families, mourn for your enemies, sing to the stars, console our grieving hearts. All citizens, put your hands in the soil and fill the ground. Feel the joy and be still and be still. Clap your hands to your mouth, let your pride go south, put your hand on your head, make terms with the dead. Put your hands on your face, too late to learn from our mistakes. Put your hand on your heart, can we stop what we start? Sisters to the leverage, brothers to the edges, youth to the floor, this bleak future is yours. All ye of noble bone, join the scum of the earth, gather around the powerless. There's the power that can save us. All citizens, put your hands in the soil and feel the growth. Can you feel the joy and be still and be still? And be still, and be still, and be still, and be still.
Right. Thank you so much for being patient with that. But I really did want to set us in a little bit to um, what the work feels like, what we talk about when we talk about our home streets and neighbourhoods, what we talk about when we use the word communities very easily. Um, and uh, we don't really prescribe what we mean by that, because I would imagine that all of us in one way or another are a part of a community, a digital one, sporting ones. Uh, geographical ones, uh, ones that are of certain interest you have. And so I really want to spend some time getting quite specific about what um, we mean by that. And in the video, I wanted to really show you this idea of um, showing you one, what our work feels like, but secondly, the critical nature of not being uh, binary or siloed in our approach to thinking, whose story is this to be part of? Is it us as professionals to communities, who do we mean? Do we mean a geographical community? Do we mean people who are marginalised by the economy and are poorer and so we work with them? Is that what we mean by community? Do we mean the streets we live on? When we talk about the community or they talk about those people or they or those in power, who are we talking about? Because from our work, I really have seen that actually it's going to be critical for the story that we are in that we get our hands, all our hands dirty and see ourselves in rich, multifaceted uh, ways. And so I go through this lecture today talking about our work in practice and relating it to uh, the social, climate and ecological crises that we find ourselves in, the deep scale of transition and transformation that is going to be required and the critical and I'd say often misrepresented role of the home, the street and the neighbourhood and very particularly talking about that as the geographical communities that we find ourselves in. And so this is what really drives our work um, in practice in the recent years. Um, the recent synthesis report from the IPCC had this um, front page which talked about the future will look different no matter what, just how different is our, is our choice. And I think that, that when we in the global north, particularly in the UK, uh, look at um, stories uh, and phrases like this, it's really critical to actually focus on how much of a privilege it is to say that just how different this will be will be our choice. There is a story of three possible warmer worlds and okay, we're, we're referring here to the climate change and heating uh, temperature change element of the wider story of climate and social and ecological um, challenges that we have. But the fact that it says there just how different is our choice. So I often reflect on what would happen if I knew I knew that I'd be part of a society that had a 10 or 15 or 20 year warning on what they needed to do and how they would step up and into that. And of course, it certainly wouldn't look like a lot of what we're doing right now. So I think this is really fascinating and I really like um, referring back to this. And I do want us to really hold on to that, just how different is our choice. And so to tell you a little bit about us, we were born out of a design studio called Zero Zero that did uh, things that you may know about, such as WikiHouse and Dark Matter Labs, Open Systems Labs, all stories of looking at what more democratic, open uh, infrastructure, planning, building, uh, creating look like. Um, and it's been around for nearly 20 years and has spun out all sorts of different things. As mentioned in the bio, um, we started off as a group of young people organising uh, with 10 of us in 2011, a TEDx in Birmingham that had 100 people at its first event. And by the end of that seven year stint had 100 volunteers and 3000 people at the, at the last event that we did. Um, and that led on to us co-founding the Impact Hub, a space to really actually understand this deep story about the role of our play, of our people, our communities, our citizenry, our residents in tackling the most uh, systemic and complex challenges of our time. And we spent five years really prototyping that. Some of you may know about the Impact Hub, but through all of this, we learned some really, really critical things. And here's some pictures so you can imagine uh, that time. We started to learn through a lot of these stories that actually it wasn't just the scale of good ideas at the surface or how convivial the community was or how incredible um, it was when they came together. And there was a number of things that were missing in the ex exploration of what we uh, needed to do. 
um, it was critical that we looked more deeply at this story. And so I just want you to look at this diagram. I don't really want you to worry about the, um, the detail. Um, but I want to share three key points that really anchor Civic Square's work. This idea of um, the different states and types of work that are required. And we have codified this into a way um, that talks about three sort of matters. We call them matters because we're probably slightly nerdy in terms of physics, but it's a typology of work rather than a specific framework that we have to follow. Um, and it talks about three types, the dark, the dream and the everyday matter. The dark matter is what we've learned is the real stories that sit underneath the surface, how things are financed, how they are owned, how they were governed, the rules, codes, norms, contracts, things that we've made in society that are under the surface that you don't see when you walk down the high street, a huge land contract and all of the landlords that own what, what they do um, on a high street. You see either the empty spaces or the big corporates or where things are thriving or they're not. So this real idea that we work in the space of looking and unpacking and rebuilding um, these ideas that we refer to as the dark matter, the things under the surface we don't see, they aren't in our everyday, but they absolutely drive the majority of what how the world works. And, you know, people will say shorthand, follow the money or look at who owns that, you know, often hear that. And so we really feel that this is a critical part of what we've learned from the early stage of our work is required. We work with a number of partners in this space, including Dark Matter Labs, Open Systems Lab, other people working on the redesign of the land contract of new financial instruments of accounting systems and frameworks for um, for ecologically just futures and so on and so on. And then we talk about something called the dream matter, the ability to think and imagine far beyond the systems we are currently in, the unlocking of that collective and creative imagination, an imagination that can believe that there are other ways to live together, to live in relationship with the planet that we're on the uh, economic system that dominates our current um, uh, ideas of how we organize in the world, that we need to be able to unlock and cultivate that radical imagination in order to be able to imagine futures far beyond now, but also to be able to design into much more longer term um, uh, stories. And then critically in our work, we believe in the everyday matter, that it is critical that these ideas are able to translate into everyday stories. So you would seen in the video that for us so much from our redesign of how we decarbonize our neighborhood and retrofit it or how we think about new economic models and our work with donor economics is also translated into very everyday experiences at the scale of the home, the street and the neighborhood. And for us, our work sings and dances in these three different types of work. We build our partnerships based on this. We work as part of an ecosystem who look at these different layers. And critically, really critically, we don't hold any one up as more important than the other. We don't think that the think tanks or the labs working on the financial redesign or the, the banks or the investors making the first move are more important and more critical to this than the everyday participation, movement, literacy building, we don't believe that um, the radical imagination and the bold, bright futures beyond today are more important. In fact, we think they sing and dance together as a story that is really critical for how we understand the many types of work. So recently when the IPCC report came out, there was this famous quote that we'll need everyone everywhere all at once doing everything. And to a certain extent, I, I absolutely thought that was a great play on popular culture. Um, and, and yes, absolutely agree with that. But what I what we know with that within that there's a lot that is going to have to be hospiced and ended, but actually in reality the the types of work that we are going to do need to do at these many different scales is how we seek to organise at Civic Square, how we build partnerships, ecosystems, and how we like to to work because we believe that it is going to be these many different stories and in all of our work we might start somewhere different. We might start with the redesign of a land contract. We might be starting with an everyday public living room um, for people to come into. We might start with imagining new economic models um, through donor economics, which is one of the pieces of work that we're, we're doing. Um, but actually, uh, whether they are effective and start to move into a story of systemic change and narrative shifting and the, the instruments and the frameworks and the, the policies that, and the movements that move us there, these different parts need to sing together. 
And so you saw from the video our work, this is a little bit of what we've been doing in our neighborhood. I'm going to tell you a tiny little um, caveat for a moment, which was that um, we uh, had a big delay with COVID. Um, we moved into the neighborhood after uh, down the road from the impact hub after we closed right at the end of 2019. We got ready to start all of uh, what you will see in the rest of this presentation and uh, COVID hit us and everything had to change. So we turned every empty space, front lawn, train platform, park corner in our neighborhood into spaces that would in the very most DIY and taking over those spaces way could start to redesign, reimagine and rebuild the stories uh, from an everyday perspective and from a bold economic futures perspective in our neighborhood over the last three years. Um, because you'll see shortly there's a, there's a big part of our work that was a capital project that got delayed. And so this is a little bit of what it looked like. And I can tell you a little bit more about um, this shortly, but I wanted to just show you some pictures so you could land yourself in who we are, where we are, at the heart of inner city Birmingham in Ladywood, um, one of the richest, beautiful, most socially and culturally um, significant places in the city and one that has been economically and infrastructurally marginalised um, for, for many decades. And at the core of our work is this question, what if the climate and ecological transition and deep retrofit of our home streets and neighbourhoods were designed, owned and governed by the people who live there? And if you look into that, you could add a few more things, finance, you could add community wealth. But if you look at this question, there's quite a lot packed into it. It really believes and looks at both the participatory power that exists in our places, but also what it means to distribute and decentralise and build resilience and capacity around ownership, stewardship, governance, finance in a place. So we really believe that the scale of the home street and neighbourhood is a critical one. But what do I kind of mean by this? Um, and so I'm going to share a little bit of historical context to give to land you in some of this, because for us, what we're trying to do in, at Civic Square is build, in essence, um, some of these small islands of coherence. I love this, this quote. When challenges can feel so vast and so big, it can be feel incredibly difficult to, to know where, where's the right leverage point. And so we really enjoy this quote because what we're trying to do is look at how we build these small islands of coherence of the futures we imagine and dream and think of demonstrated today in the most systemic ways possible. But when we think about our home streets and neighbourhoods, what am I talking about? Because actually, often I'll hear the word communities used and I kind of always ask, what do you, what do you mean? Do you mean poor people? Do you mean people not like you? Do you mean community of people who get together to look after each other or garden or grow and often people don't really know what they mean. This is why I really enjoy this idea of the home street and neighbourhood because there is a critical nature of, of this in the scale of the challenges we face. There was a whole bunch of slides I wanted to share with you about, um, about the scale of challenges we face um, but I, I just didn't have enough time. But I wanted to say that the UK Climate Change Committee talked um, recently in their report a couple of months ago about the scale of impact on the top eight of 62 risks to the UK include severe impact to our water systems, our supply chains, our power systems um, that need to be urgently looked at. And so when we think about this, we're talking about a scale of transition that we possibly can't really comprehend from the way we need to retrofit our homes to the way we need to the scale of the numbers that we need to do from the uh, system of power, from um, the quality of housing, from the material poverty that people find themselves in real and um, relative uh, poverty right now. And, and um, on top of that, we've got impacts on our water system, on our freshwater system, on soil. On, and if you look into the recent report, Honestly, I think it's really critical for us to engage with the idea of how vast the scale of challenge that we are going to face and the shifts we are going to have to make. And a lot of people say this feels really scary and I don't know what to do. And I want to take a couple of steps back to say, actually, I think what we're going to face is unprecedented in a way that we in the global north can't imagine. I don't think there's any example in history that you can just pick up and use and say, hey, we've done this before. Uh, we know what to do but that doesn't render us useless. 
that doesn't mean we just sit back and wait and look at uh, the power, at what those in um, significant power or a nation level will do, or just look at um, the massive legislative and legal shifts that we need, or the, rightly so the fossil fuel industry, but only think that we wait until one thing happens and then we'll be able to do our bit. Because there are stories in history that tell us how critical the home street and neighbourhood is. One such example uh, is when we founded the NHS. The NHS was an example after the war, arguably a time where we needed to really transition from one way of being with significant, particularly social challenges that we understood into rebuilding our country. And I use this very imperial example with its own caveats that it is riddled with uh, many contradictions around the privilege that Britain um, had and the way that wealth was also hoarded and extracted during that time. But when we looked at what it meant to rebuild society after that time, we invested in the NHS fundamentally because we believed that health or we'd understood by this point that health was going to be critical. A healthy nation was going to be critical in rebuilding our economy, in rebuilding our country, in rebuilding our places. But when we invested in the NHS, we didn't just invest in a national vision. We invested in regional uh, hospitals. We invested in uh, legislation. We understood the policies, we understood the national systems that we had to build, but we also understood that we needed to build something really critical in this story, which was neighbourhood GPs. Because if we wanted a societal transition to happen, we would need to democratise the access to the tools, the knowledge, the spaces, the convening, the expertise to society at large, so they could participate in this transition in a way that was meaningful so that everybody could practically get their hands and their lives and their stories into what it meant to rebuild. Because that wasn't just the moral thing to do. At this point, we were so stuck that unless everyone everywhere with all hands on deck were able to participate, this transition would not have been able to happen. And it's really critical when we talk about the radical imagination to remember that there's so much, so much suppressing our imagination today about what could be possible. Um, is that 30 years before this, and the slide shows this, Treadgar Medical Aid Society had asked that question and were demonstrating from the ground up through the medical aid societies and the co-ops ways in which people were organising around their health. That could have been akin to a question that you would now say, well, that's really imaginative or that's too big picture, because at that point they were essentially asking a question of what if everybody had access to health at point of need, not if they could pay. 30 or 40 years before the NHS, this would have been unthinkable. So the role of the imagination to stretch our possibility of what other stories could look like and to demonstrate them in reality and then follow up and build a new class of public goods for the time is critical. So when we think about the home street and neighbourhood in this layer, it wasn't just, well, we'll ask the people how they want to get healthy later on. We'll consult them on a few things that we've. No, 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 no. This was about building infrastructure at the scale of our home streets and neighbourhoods to democratise access to agency, to resource, to knowledge, to literacy, to spaces, to expertise, so that everybody could participate. And we have many stories like this. We can look at the era of the industrial era to um, uh, the, the, the time just post-industrial, uh, where we knew that we needed to democratise access to uh, learning and skills and education because Lo and behold, from a moral side, there was many people that believed that. And, you know, I, of course, am more on the sort of moral uh, equity and just transition side. But actually, again, here comes a time in society where the economy is buckling. The owners of the means of production and the factory and is starting to realise that without access to knowledge, without education, they would not have a workforce that was able to transition into this new future. And there's a whole history of how the public libraries came into place and how the community libraries, again, at the scale of your home, your street, your neighbourhood, at the neighbourhood scale, democratised access. And this is critical. This is so critical. And when we think about what we're building um, now and um, 
And again, you know, it was very much perhaps on the Quaker side from a more moral story, uh, from a lot of the industrialists at the time, you store in Birmingham, um, factory workers starting to give, uh, factory owners giving access to their workers to clean house, uh, clean air through um, green spaces, to good quality housing, to building train lines to, the, to Wales from Birmingham so people could have holidays. So we started to understand again, if we want a society to transition, we are going to have to uh, demonstrate and build new forms of de democratic access to the tools that so everybody can transition and be part of that story. And arguably after those early moves, these became new public goods. And so that's what we're really working on. We're working on what can we learn from all of that? What can we learn from our histories? I use British Imperial UK histories because of where we are, but all around the world, um, there are stories um, and uh, non-Western uh, examples of how um, such large times have um, built transition infrastructure. And so we work on this idea, and I love this quote from Dan Hill in Designing Missions, um, which is an excellent book that I'd recommend to everybody, which is in, it links really to that um, quote from Ilya that I just shared around in all of this uncertainty and complexity and many things, biodiversity crisis, ecological, social, but it's the rules and we need to imagine other things and the land contract and how do we make it participatory? It's very easy for things to get lost to the point where we're rendered useless. And so we really hang ourselves on um, uh, ideas like this, which is what it means to demonstrate futures in tangible and inspirational ways that are systemic in their nature that can look at how the finance would be redesigned in that, that would look at what the new ownership or stewardship models might be that are more cooperative and just, that would look at many different multiple outcomes that would be participatory and imaginative in their, in their approach. And that's how we, we really have been building a lot of the ideas at Civic Square. And I'm going to tell you about the three kind of very uh, top level demonstration areas that we work on. So in this inner city neighbourhood in Birmingham, we're building and looking at old industrial infrastructure, but you could place this infrastructure in any different way. You could look at high streets, empty shops, small sites, um, this idea that we have to do and become a lot more imaginative with what we already have. In our case, it's really about a large scale demonstrator of what it means to build the equivalent of the community libraries, the neighbourhood GPs, the new public goods, the new democratic access at the scale of the home street and neighborhood that will be crucial to people being able to participate and to drive this transition and this shift that we need to see from an extractive and degenerative system that sees the planet as a kind of externality towards a distributive by design regenerative one and so we're really building a, a, a a site that will look at things like community kitchens, um, waste, energy infrastructure, solar grids, micro factories, workspaces, and so on and so on. Through this, we're looking at how we have um, cooperative and perpetual ownership and stewardship models. And we're looking at how it will be financed, as well as the practical bold site at the heart of the neighborhood, the public square for the transition. But like I said, I don't necessarily believe that everybody has to go and find a huge 100,000 square foot site and start building a new. It's a metaphor for us really understanding how to retrofit and rebuild um, the infrastructure we will need on our high streets, on our small sites in many places to really build that class of new public goods that is going to help us to make over a generation the scale of change we need to. And some people are like, hey, well, why does this matter so much? It isn't just a moral story. I come from the story of justice and equity in our, in, in our work and in our politics and in our histories. But honestly, you could just take any one challenge. You could look at the fact that we need to retrofit homes once every three seconds uh, in this country to be anywhere close to hitting 2030 targets and how far away we are from that. You could look at how much of a hydrocarbon budget we're going to need to be able to do that and realise we don't have the material budgets to do that. This isn't just a moral story of like include communities, include people. Yes, that's critical. This is a pragmatic and very um, crucial part of if we are going to be able to do any of that at all. If we are going to be able to reimagine resourcing, material usage, how we organise tools, access to um the spaces, the knowledge, the learning, the skills in our neighbourhoods to even have any chance of meeting that. 
Secondly, we've been really working with our neighbourhood, and you saw this um, in the in the video uh, around looking at what is the new economic thinking. So we've been doing three years of really immersive work with our neighbourhood and neighbourhoods across the world, looking at what it means for the donut to be a 21st century compass that really looks at the integrated challenges and the interconnected challenges socially, ecologically, people and planet. We've been doing everything from knowledge and data work to primary uh, research, uh, planetary uh, boundaries and all sorts in the neighbourhood. And on the bottom right, you can see how we co-created with our neighbourhood and many partners a baseline of how we're doing. A space where people could take one look and go, wow, OK, our neighbourhood's doing well there and it's really overshooting here and there. And this is really uh, the beginnings of what is a dashboard and a story uh, for how we can have a compass that is orientating us towards the right direction. And so thirdly, again, we in our neighbourhood, we're then putting a lot of these ideas into practice through street based transitions, where we are looking at street demonstrations of energy, ecological built environment transition led by the neighbourhood, where collective financing, governing, energy co-ops, all sorts actually happen, happen at the street la layer and we can build up the types of movements that we need. And our role as Civic Square is to really prototype and show the infrastructure that can support that. And so I share this quote, I'd probably, the late, great David Graeber, um, uh, I'd probably tell him that maybe we should not write just as easily because it's not that easily. But it is really critical to understand that we do have a lot in our histories that can teach us about what sort of scale of shift we need to make at this time. And actually what we need to take from that is open the problem space up to the scale of crisis, breakdown, challenge and opportunity that sits ahead and look at what we can learn for how we build the right type of infrastructure to support that and why the home street and neighbourhood is not just something you consult at, you go and visit, you take photos of, but actually how critical it is going to be to have agency, literacy and empowerment over that movement. And I'm just going to leave you on um, a really practical, tangible example of this uh, layers of work that I've talked about with our great friends in Bristol, We Can Make, who we've been working alongside. And I thought it'd be a great example to show you something and tell you about something that isn't just us. So what started as an artistic residency as part of Noel West Media Centre in the heart of an inner city neighbourhood in, in Bristol, where they neighbours explored the idea of home, quickly led into the most profound um, uh, work that I conceive of what happens when we understand the power of modern technology, of looking at new supplies of land and the ownership methods around that, and when we look at a deep participatory approach. There's a beautiful 16 minute video that I can't show you, but I'm going to put it in the chat. If there's one thing you do after this, go and watch that. Because what they've done here is they have taken real world challenges of um, uh, overcrowding of the housing crisis, they've taken small sites within Knoll West. They've used a micro, they've built a micro factory on site and people from all across the uh, socioeconomic spectrum have been designing, building and participating in showing really profound um, uh, uh, solutions to the housing crisis and, um, and then the retrofit, the deeper retrofits of our neighbourhoods ecologically around that. And they've got a, a very, very... Um, advanced uh, work now on this where they have got the policy for government, they've got cross-party support, they've got homes being built on small sites in um, Knoll West uh, in Bristol, which is a, an old industrial uh, war uh, um, so, uh, estate that was built just after the war. Um, they've got the tools, they've got the micro factories, they've got communities designing, they've got people who are on council waiting lists for overcrowding, moving out of their homes with their parents into a site a few minutes down the road that they've built and designed. And, and they've done all of the work around this in a really profound way. And so I just want to come back to, to this quote to say that when it feels like a system is far from equilibrium and it feels like what, what on earth, what on earth do we do? These small islands of radical coherence that demonstrate really imaginative possibilities tangibly and practically in today um, is, is our priority. And this is what I think that we should really be focusing on. And we should be understanding and not infantilizing our communities as something that we think about afterwards or go and consult at, but understand historically in any time whether it was the pandemic and how we organised, or whether it was post-war Britain or many other examples, it was from that scale that we were able to build this type of mass 
um, participation in uplifting, changing, shifting, transitioning, and this is critical. Um, and so I don't have much time. happened sorry about that um the video i was about to say i don't have much time to show you the video um that i was going to finish out on so i'm going to stop stop there but what i i was going to say is i'll put a few links and my original presentation in the um in the chat so you can have a look at some of the ideas where i've shared a bit more about projects like we can make um, the scale of system demonstrators, some ex some really deep work from our neighbourhood donut work. And I, what I want to kind of leave you with is this really profound idea about rethinking what we believe is possible at the home street and neighbourhood level. Because I would say that out of the whole, and if Kate Raywith was here, she would tell you that out of the whole global movement of, of the Donut Economics um, Action Lab communities, the amount of insight participation, depth, knowledge, participation at many layers of the challenge that has come from the neighbourhood scale has been like nothing she's seen across the world. And so I leave you with this thought that actually without us really re-understanding our relationship at that scale, democratising the access to the knowledge, the literacy, the imaginations, our own participation in the places where we live, and our own rethinking of where we sit and do our work from and where the challenges and possibilities and energy really are is critical to whether we're going to be able to um, transition at all. And you have to remember that currently we are hurtling towards 1.5 and probably going to shoot straight past that. And at 2 and 2.5 degrees, we start to have fundamental termination of systems. And what we have in the global north is an opportunity, an opportunity to actually have a head start on that. And if we can't, after the damage that we have created across the world, really understand that responsibility and throw everything in the kitchen sink at it, um, and I would argue from the scale of the home street and neighbourhood, not in isolation, in partnership with our cities, our regions, our nations, uh, the planetary space, then we really will have been a generation that failed to do anything with the knowledge, the privilege, the resources and the time that we had to do something profound. I just want to say thank you very much for having me and sorry for that slight bizarre tech moment where I was going to say to you, um, <laughs> I haven't got time to show you this video. Thank you. Thanks, Emmy, for that. Um, just so powerful to, to start with that video, I think, and see people from all ages, all parts of society just participating, I think, and being part of change, I guess. Um, and I guess seeing the, the smiles, you know, there was lots of smiles. There was, you know, clearly a theme of people being comfortable, whether it was their pets being there, whether it was sharing some food together. It's, those are sometimes the most important moments. And I guess they're the, you know, to come to that, that quote that you put up, Sometimes those people are the, the small islands of coherence, I guess, mm -hmm. in that sea of chaos, because they're that stability that then creates a ripple effect across the community, regardless of the scale that you're looking at it. Um, and I thought that was, was such a powerful point to, to put forward. Um, I have got um, some questions that I'll, I'll put to you. Um, and um, hopefully we'll get through them all. If we don't manage to get through all the questions, we will. You you'd offered previously that you'll you'll try and answer some of them beyond that if needed as well. But we just wondered the first one. Um, can you outline how you've managed to make the creative change that you have whilst working against or with what can often be inflexible systems and organisations? Yeah. So I I do think that it's important to say that I. I believe that the quite young and resistive, and when I say young, I mean young at heart, I don't mean age, um, a young at heart and like really possible and quite resistive uh, early movements during TEDx um, as part of a city that is full of all sorts of magic, but also has quite a large inflexible 
huge uh, local authority and many other things was actually critical because what we understood quite early on 10 12 years ago before we'd done any of this was that actually um there is a role for oppositional politics and oppositional um movements you know i'm i'm all here with them uh, and very grateful for everyone from just stock oil to insulate britain for being able to like actually bring uh, those resistive moments to the story. But I understood really clearly that for us, it was about a propositional story that we were going to have to tell. We were going to, we weren't going to be able to work up against a lot of these inflexible systems that infantilized the scale of work that we were doing down to kind of, you know, you guys sort of palliative care and, and clean up the, the litter and, and sweep up the snow and, you know, do coffee mornings with each other, which are all very beautiful and important things, as you can see from our videos, we'll get involved in anything, but actually um, saw this as like a, like a kind of palliative care. Like people just look after the communities while the people in, in serious big power kind of will get on with the, the serious stuff of net zero. And, um, and so, you know, very early on, we learned about the need to propose and show what we meant in every which way possible. Um, and I think that increasingly, uh, I and this might not be the most inspiring answer. There's lots and lots of different uh, chapters I've taken with this, what I think. But I just want to say increasingly, I think it's incumbent on us to put as many yeah, islands of coherence and as many uh, ideas on the table, because in a crisis, it's the ideas on the table that are already there that we grab and they form and they reform into whatever they need to be. You know, we saw this in, in COVID. Um, things transformed quickly with whatever whatever was already there, whatever we could find lying around metaphorically, whatever kitchen you could get into and open the door of. Um, even if you're, you know, I lived on a high street and I remember, remember the Prezzo uh, having this massive commercial kitchen and they just locked it up and left it for nine months and then uh, like 12 months and then in the end they went out of business and all I remember seeing was them ripping the kitchen out afterwards. Meanwhile, in the pandemic, somebody had been opening their back door, cooking food and passing it out over the over the fence, right? And so increasingly, I'm interested in this, this piece around the proposition, getting as many ideas and coherent and resilient and anti-fragile things on the table um, for what I personally think is probably a few decades of compounding permanent crisis before we may well see something um, emerge out of the back of that. And within that, I think what is really critical for me is when I look at these moments, the Treadgar Medical Aid Society, or the movements that were teaching education and, and skills to the working class people, for example, uh, in the industrial in the industrial time, we've got a great example of that in Birmingham, whereby the Quakers set up Fircroft College, which was for working class people to get free education because they were worried about the elitism of Chamberlain's University of Birmingham, right? Um, that was being built at the same time. So what I've seen from a lot of these times is these demonstrations and these organizing and these working class movements on the ground from history and in many other histories, Black Panther Party, so many other times that I'm from, my parents were post-partition Britain, uh, India, sorry, um, and, you know, all the stories there. What they give a signal to is things that become future public goods what I've seen when we tend to see that transition at scale is that it actually isn't necessarily the moral story. The moral story has built all that work because we're all there building the examples. What happens is things no longer become viable, right? So the economy starts to crack. We can't rebuild the country. We can't get the skills. We can't get the workers. Things are slowing down to a point. So what I use in this is that idea, which is I'm not sure how much of my personal energy is there to be up against, up against. I work with people who can write things into policy. I work with people who engage with council and systems and net zero, but I see my role and our skills in putting those ideas on the table and creating the ideas that in 10 or 20 years time, and probably arguably, arguably for us much quicker than that will become the future. Uh, public goods and you can see tests of this we've already tasted we've already tasted basic income in in an inequitable way because it didn't it wasn't for everyone um when furlough happened we were already tasting the four-day working week and arguably a version of positive degrowth and reducing our consumption and our movement and all of that because corporates are starting to understand that we can see and taste some of it 
And so that's how I how I focus. Focus on what we can propose, what we can build, who we can work with for the bits that we find very difficult to engage with. But critically, how are we getting ready for what I believe is an inevitable, no longer fit for purpose economic system um, and a, approach to the way that we we will think about our public goods because we're going to move towards a survival type space um, and everything will change then. Um, I'm not I'm not apoc apocalyptic about it, though, because I think things are going to get hard. And I think we're all going to have to reckon with the impact that that has on those that have the least. But in Britain, we've been sitting knowing that for the last 60 years of industrial progress, that there were victims to what we did. So in that, what I'm really what I'm really passionate about is um, I believe that human in, that there's something there's a much better story amongst all of us and it will rise. And these apocalyptic stories aren't the ones that come post disaster. So actually, with the time we have, what do we do in terms of proposing as many things to be picked up? And that's how I sort of deal with with those inflexible systems and organisations, which is if I can't if I can't get there, I don't burn myself. I work with those that can, but I focus on proposing what what might be other futures. Thanks, Amy. And I think it is just heading towards that idea of sometimes it's a small idea, isn't it, that you can grow something from if you've got the right people around you, the ones that are willing to work with you rather than against you, and I guess supporting the storytelling of it all, the, the successes and the things that maybe haven't always gone right as well, because that's how we learn as a society, because there's no perfect answer to what we do. We've got time for one um, final quick question just now. Um, I'm conscious of the time for everyone. Where do you think planners and spatial planning fit within this? And, and do do they or do does planning need to change? Well, yeah, I would say that there's a critical role for um, planners in this. You know, I'd put uh, planning rules, codes, norms at the heart of like, and some of that dark matter, right? And there's a great project from our some of our peers at Open Systems Lab um, called Planex, which is all about um, making planning uh, less, basically less hard and, and to work for people. Um, and so I think that what is really, really important is, is the being able to um, uh, activate the imagination within your field what what are things if you were sitting 30 years before the nhs at a time where it was very normal for the rich to have access to health and everybody else well good luck see what happens um what are the impossible questions the impossible binds that you're in where do you know that planning is part of the problem where do you know that your field and sector is part of the problem and every day you go to work and you're like i know that it would be different if we could work on that and where do you build the communities um, and the confidence to speak to this, to start to organise about around first imagining what alternative futures would look like and then backwards from that, starting to build the capacity to prototype, demonstrate and show what other ways of being in the smallest ways possible could look like. So, you know, if you go onto the Plan X website, th this wasn't this wasn't what what we were thinking 10 years ago, it wasn't what was what we were identifying is where where are all the problem points? Where are the things that are actually stopping us from being more socially, ecologically just? And um, where are we actually creating damage and problems and harm? How do we first create the space to not just berate ourselves and have shame, but to imagine alternate futures? How do we then create the space to go backwards and start to prototype and demonstrate and be able to point to and then how from there do we make those into not exceptional projects, but patterns and norms and policies and legislation? And I think, you know, to finish, my colleague in Johar and Dark Matter Labs, they call this the boring revolution, right? It's all the stuff. It's the little things that are in these stories that we've made about how the world works. And I think planning um, and planners are in such a good place to look at all of the blockages and challenges and contradictions within the system and start to surface those and feel confident about what it means 
to to challenge, rebuild, and reimagine them. And I would recommend starting from the reimagining point because shame doesn't do anything. Hiding it and pretending you're not doing it or pretending that's not a problem or pretending there's not contradictions doesn't actually unlock us. But being able to ask the question, what if, what if, what if, and to galvanise a propositional community around it and then work backwards from there to go, how do we make that real? That would be, that would be my uh, advice. And, and I'm going to be really transparent. Um, the only bits of the planning system that I know about are the ones that intersect with the type of work we do. I'm sure there is a whole ton of stuff you could tell me that you're like, yeah, over here, this is actively completely out of sync with actually where we need to be going or there's some real problems here. But ultimately, um, planning comes uh, really clearly into what it means to unlock the agency of our home streets and neighbourhoods. Um, and you'll know a lot about that through climate action plans, local plans, etc. So you've got to see yourself as a bit of an entrepreneur and a and a and a person like not just a technical brain within that, but actually a source of possibility and innovation because you can see leverage points where you can also make minor tweaks to the current system and go off in a in a really bold direction. So people like you can also navigate the existing system and say to Imi or to Melissa in Bristol, oh, you know what, don't worry about that. I can tell you about this small, like go in this direction. And we can, within existing laws and rules and norms, um, we can actually get something there quite interesting. So um, it's about really getting your systems uh, hat on. And I would really recommend Danella Meadows' uh, uh, work on leverage points and start to see where your leverage points are for maximal reimagination, innovation, and also uh, looking between the rules uh, and working between in the systems that we already have. Thanks, Amy. I think it is. It's drive, being drivers of change, isn't it? Use that imagination and not sit behind the the what if. And actually, it's the what do we do now? Yeah, um, we would say um, going from um, what if uh, to what what going from what is to what if to so what. Right. So we've imagined. Great. We feel good. What are we going to do with that? And it's remembering that last bit <laughs> and making sure. What? And some of you, some of you will be much more comfortable in the current system. So you might be brilliant in that what is moment. I can tell you what is and how we can get around it. Some of you might be better in the big thinking reimagination in the what if, but some of you might be more pragmatic and like, I need to get to the so what, this was great. What you've got to do is not berate each other as that one part of that story is more important than the other. They have to sing and dance together and play together. The pragmatist, pragmatists and the dreamers and those that can get between the rules and look at the leverage points, you're all critically important. What I find in this work is that we just have such a lot of, no, oh, but that's too imaginative, that's too technical, that's too deep, that's too pragmatic, that's not big enough. That and and we need to have better conversations and be in better ecosystems with one another and unlock each other's skills in ways that drive, like as Kirsty said, the, that transformative uh, change. That's excellent. I think that seems like the perfect place to actually bring in Stephen Hajduki, who um, is going to offer our uh, vote of thanks. See if Stephen's going to join us. We still can't hear you, Stephen. Oh dear. We do love technology, but not when it's it's going to work. But Stephen has very kindly sent me some words, um, which I can also read on um, Stephen's behalf as well. Um, so if you're so kind as telling me to do that, Stephen, I'll just go ahead with that just now. Thank you so much. Um, so Stephen is um, uh, part of the Sir Patrick Met Gary's Memorial Trust and we're delighted that he could offer his vote of thanks today. So as one of the older generation of planners, and I almost feel I'm saying that about myself too, um, who entered the system in the late 1970s, I recall how planning was still then dominated by the remnants of the post-war brave new world of approach of a shining future, which if the visualizations are to be believed, consisted of complicated urban motorway junctions punctuated by random tower blocks. Fortunately, Edinburgh then as now takes so long to make decisions that by the time they did, it had gone out of fashion and it was heading towards a more socially responsible approach of people, places and neighborhoods. 
Ironically, this is exactly what Geddes had been proposing a hundred years earlier, but was seen as something of a crank, as were, th as were those of us who thought he had something worthwhile to say. So it's been a great pleasure to have heard Emmy's presentation with the ideas and proposals that, proposals that Geddes would have been very comfortable with. The emphasis of interconnection of community, neighbourhoods, economic issues, social issues, welfare stewardship and so on, which lead to genuine placemaking, which is more than just fancy paving and trendy benches. That joined up thinking about the balance of issues that is so often aspired to, but not always achieved in our silo mentality. So thank you, Amy, for a very inspiring talk and thank you also to our TPI Scotland for arranging the event. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you very um, much. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's so right. You see those interconnections between conversations and ideas that have been of the past and that we're still trying to deliver here in the future. Um, and I think in terms of closing remarks for myself, you know, you, you talk about big picture, Emmy. You talk about, um, you know, this is, there's, there's lots of work to do. This is, this is not an overnight thing. This, there will never be a perfect fix. There's got to be lots of testing, prototyping, learning from mistakes, sharing the good stories over a, a bowl of soup or in a kitchen or in a park. Um, and I think it's that idea of embracing change, being bold and, you know, almost going out and, and disrupting what could be considered some of the norm because we have to challenge the change. Otherwise, we're never going to deliver that, that theory of change to the future. So thank you so much for such an inspiring presentation um, this lunchtime. It's been really appreciated and I'm definitely going to wait to go and have a little look at that um, video that you were um, going to, to share earlier. So I, thank thoroughly, you so much. I really recommend that as, as just a way of seeing that within the exist, we've got everything we need. We, ju we just need to re reorganise it. Um, and at least if we can demonstrate it, um, you know, that's a great start for for saying for bringing the future into into now and and showing its possibility. So, yeah, I really recommend it. I'll share it in the chat and want to say thank you to you all for having me as well. You're welcome. Thanks so much. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. The recording will be available on YouTube next week um, and we'll make sure all the links are shared out. Thank you so much and have a fabulous rest of the day. Great, thank you.